Hi everyone, Rich Savelle here. In today's video, we're going to try to cover a few topics that are interrelated, and I think they're very interesting. First, we're going to be discussing the very basics of how a pulse oximeter works. We're going to explain to you enough of the basics so that you can understand some of the limitations of a pulse oximeter in the intensive care unit. Next, we're going to be discussing some of the dyshemoglobinopathies. For example, our major focus will be on methemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia, carbon monoxide poisoning. Then, we'll conclude by talking about some of the basics of cyanide toxicity, and the reason we're going to bring that up is some of the treatments are related to an understanding of methemoglobinemia. So let's get started. A pulse oximeter, which is so fundamental to the understanding of caring for a critically ill patient, is very interesting in how it works. As most of you know, it is a small device that goes usually on the end of a finger or on the ear or some other part of the tissue where it can work. The way it works is that it shines light through the tissue. Specifically, it shines two wavelengths of light, usually 660 and 940, 660 being red and 940 being infrared. There are light emitting diodes that emit that light and on the other side of the tissue there are photoreceptors that look to see how much of the light has gone through. It measures when there's a pulse and subtracts out the baseline light that happens uh, before the pulse occurs and the assumption is that the during the pulse the blood that is going in is arterial. It's important to understand that the fundamental way it works is that uh, hemoglobin that is fully oxygenated, that has 100% oxygen on it, will allow a certain amount of the red light and a certain amount of the infrared light to go through. And conversely, tissues or, or hemoglobin that has 0% oxygen on it will have a different pattern in terms of how much of the red and infrared will go through. And in the computer in the pulse oximeter, it's been calibrated on a lookup table to be able to know and correlate with the varying uh, patterns of absorption and transmission of the different uh, wavelengths. The fundamental problem here is the computer in the pulse oximeter is assuming that there is either two that there are two fundamental states that the heme can be in, either oxygenated or not oxygenated. And that's where the problem comes in. And that's why it's important for you to understand this. There are two other important relevant clinical states. There is met hemoglobinemia, which is Fe3 plus or ferric uh, uh, iron in the heme molecule, and carboxyhemoglobin, in which instead of the heme uh, iron and heme binding to oxygen, it binds to carbon monoxide. And I'd like to take a few moments on each of those. There are certain important common um, uh, drugs that can cause methemoglobinemia, and some of them are listed here. Some of the important ones include dapsone, as well as the local anesthetics. It's important for you to understand that as one gets more and more methemoglobin in one's body, the pulse oximeter reads that as 85% uh, oxygen. And so the question that you would ask is, how can one determine how much methemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin is there in a patient in which you may have a clinical suspicion? And the term is a co-oximeter. And most of the time that has to be done in a, a blood gas lab in which they have a co-oximeter machine. And fundamentally, it has the same concept as a regular pulse oximeter, but instead of using two wavelengths, it usually uses up to eight wavelengths of light. And it will report back four states. It will say, of all of your hemoglobin, what percent does not have any oxygen? What percent is carboxyhemoglobin? What percent is methemoglobin? And what percent is oxygenated hemoglobin? And that's very important for you to understand when you have a patient where they may not look well. And for example, in a patient with severe methemoglobinemia, 
will have an oxygen saturation of 85% because that's the pattern of absorption for both the red and infrared um, that met hemoglobin provides. The other thing to understand is that the treatment for met hemoglobinemia is usually to give the patient methylene blue, usually one milligram per kilogram, unless the patient has G6PD deficiency, and then ascorbic acid is to be used, which is somewhat less effective. So this leads next to a discussion of carboxyhemoglobin, and it's important to remember that both met hemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia have fundamentally similar effects on the body's ability to handle oxygen. And as you'll see, in carboxyhemoglobin uh, amia, in carboxyhemoglobinemia, the car uh, carbon monoxide binds avidly to the iron molecule in heme, and it causes an allosteric change in the hemoglobin molecule such that the other three spots for oxygen are much, much less likely to give up their oxygen. And this is very similar to what happens in met hemoglobin. In met hemoglobinemia, Fe3 plus cannot bind to oxygen, but a similar allosteric change occurs in which the other three spots for oxygen, if they are binding to oxygen, are much less likely to give up oxygen. And so it takes it and takes your oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and brings it down and to the left. That's very important to understand. So meaning that you are unable to get oxygen into your hemoglobin and what oxygen is there is unlikely to dissociate and be able to be used by the tissues. So it's a very suboptimal situation. So we mentioned the basics of met hemoglobinemia is to give methylene blue and the very basics of treating carboxyhemoglobin is to recognize it and to give high levels of oxygen. If necessary, intubate the patient, and if necessary, be at a center that can do hyperbaric oxygen. The last thing I want to bring up in this short video is to talk briefly about cyanide toxicity. And I think it's interesting to bring it up for two reasons. One is, it used to be more commonly used than it is now, but a drug sodium nitroprusside as you can see from the picture, contains a large number of cyanide molecules which have to be broken down by the body. And the problem is that this can cause toxicity in certain patients and helps you understand the basics of other patients who may present with cyanide toxicity because it's important to understand that there's a significant overlap in patients who present with cyanide toxicity and those who present with carbon monoxide toxicity. Cyanide works by blocking oxidative phosphorylation, and this can rapidly kill a person. And so the old treatment used to be using amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite to cause methemoglobinemia. And as we said before, not that methemoglobinemia is so great, but it's better than dying of cyanide toxicity. And so what you would give would be a combination of amyl nitrite, and actually that would be sniffed, sodium nitrite IV, and sodium thiosulfate. And so what would happen is you would induce a methemoglobinemia. This would cause cyanomethemoglobin, which would prevent you from actively dying of cyanide toxicity. And then the sodium thiosulfate would be turned into sodium thiocyanate, and that would be excreted by the kidneys. So there's a lot of sort of chemistry there, but I think it's really interesting. Relating back the basics of pulse oximetry, the basics of understanding that a pulse oximeter may have some limitations. Specifically, they can have limitations in the other abnormal hemoglobin states, carboxyhemoglobin and methemoglobin. Remembering that high levels of methemoglobinemia, you will look like you have an oxygen saturation of 85% on your pulse oximeter when you don't and that high levels of carbon monoxide, you will look like you have a normal oxygen saturation because carbon monoxide has a similar absorptive pattern as oxygenated hemoglobin. I think it's important to remember the basic treatment uh, of methemoglobinemia. We talked about giving methylene blue, some of the common causes such as dapsone and some of the uh, local anesthetics such as benzocaine.
I think it's important to remember to think about something like carbon monoxide poisoning and to aggressively treat it. And finally, I think it's interesting to understand the fundamental mechanism of cyanide toxicity and how we treat it, used to treat it primarily by causing a methemoglobinemia with amyl nitrite and sodium nitrite, and then the sodium thiosulfate would turn into sodium thiocyanate. Now we primarily, uh, it is recommended as a first line agent to use hydroxocobalamin, which then binds and causes cyanocobalamin, which is released by the kidneys, but does not require there to induce a methemoglobinemia. I hope you found that interesting. And thanks again for watching.